Over the last couple of videos, I focused pretty heavily on rhythm games that make use of a guitar controller. But not all rhythm games are played with a guitar, in fact only a few of them are. Curb your carpal tunnel and drop your plastic guitars because today we're going to take a look at frequency and amplitude. First up, Frequency, developed by Harmonix and published by SCEA in 2001, is a three-button neo-techno rhythm game. Originally, Harmonix pitched the idea to Microsoft, but we're told by then Vice President Ed Fries that no rhythm game would succeed without custom hardware. I don't know if it was spy or a challenge accepted, but Harmonix wasn't so quick to give up on their ideas. An article from G4 dated August 14th, 2009 describes an encounter that Harmonix founder Alex Rogopoulos had with Freeze. They apparently found it funny that Microsoft passed on frequency, but Freeze did thank Rogopoulos for giving him credit for his advice. It was that advice that inadvertently led to the development of Guitar Hero. The writer of the article ends the line with, Microsoft having Guitar Hero as a first party exclusive. How crazy would that have been? Nobody can see the future, but that statement aged like fine milk. The last notable fact about this game's background is that it was one of the first games to use the PS2 network adapter for online multiplayer. I think I've given enough backstory though, let's actually talk about the game. First thing, the gameplay. Imagine Guitar Hero, where notes move along a highway and you hit them as they pass by the hit window. There are two ways to play the notes. The first is by using L1, R1, and R2, and the second is by using square, triangle, and circle. You can also do what I do and combine the two for a more comfortable control style. The idea is pretty simple. Play a sequence of notes without missing, and then when that sequence is is finished, use the d-pad to change the highway. Chaining sequences together multiplies your score and refills your energy. Energy is always draining, so chaining together sequences is essential to survival. There are a few small problems that prevent it from being a great experience. At the forefront are the charts themselves, which usually don't line up properly with what my ears are hearing. Some tracks, like drums and vocals, are done really well, but others feel like they're purposely wrong to throw you off. Tucked behind that is the hit detection window and note hitboxes. The actual window is fine, but the note hitboxes feel really small. Small. There's roughly a full centimeter between the edge of the note and the hitbox. Once you figure that out, it's not too hard to get behind, but that doesn't mean it feels good. It's still really tight. Visually, frequency both looks and feels like it crawled out of 2001. The game opens with this really crazy FMV reminiscent of the runoff 90s. Like, not quite into the 2000s yet, and not quite out of the 90s yet. Just that awkward part in between. The arenas aren't really great or exciting. It's a lot of bright neon colors and weird geometry that you likely won't be looking at very much if you're actually playing. I like this rotation highway tunnel, but it can be a bit overwhelming at times. The note models definitely look like an early predecessor for the Guitar Hero notes, but they have more of a rugged and gem cut look to them. It's kind of charming, but that's probably the only charming thing about it. This game would give me a headache if I played it for too long. The setlist is really weird. 11 of the 27 total tracks were made specifically for the game, and most of the ones that aren't are still early aughts DJ tracks. There's nothing particularly recognizable about it, but to its credit, that adds to the charm a little bit. I said before in my Guitar Freaks video that my favorite part of an experience like this is getting to hear music that I've never heard before. And that same thing is true here. It adds to the challenge of a rhythm game and also introduces me to things that might shift my personal taste in music. Diving into the unknown like that is exciting. At the end of everything, this game is alright, but it seriously feels like the first game of its kind. We'll call that Tekken Syndrome. There was no real critical consensus on it. The reviews range from mid to literal perfection, and a few people outright hate it. I personally think that it's okay. It's by no means the worst rhythm game I've ever played, but it's so far from the best that giving it an above average rating just doesn't feel right. All of that in mind, I'll give Frequency a rating of 6 out of 10. It's history, you know, it's a part of laying the groundwork for something much greater. It has some flaws, though, and it isn't spectacular or a must play, but it's still something worth looking back on. Next up, the real star of the video, Amplitude, released in 2003, is the direct sequel to Frequency. This time around, the entire goal was to make the game more comfortable and more accessible. Gone are the days of grapheme color synesthesia. Rather than the highways being laid out in this tunnel, they're now all side by side, which is such a huge difference. It feels much more comfortable to navigate, and less like I'm gonna get a headache looking at it. There are also curves in the track that warp your perspective of the notes, so it becomes important to read and execute patterns in time, rather than trying to time everything out by touch. To give the game a little bit more personality, we now take on the role of a spaceship using a blaster. You can switch between first and third person view of the ship, and personally, the third person view is perfectly comfortable. There's also the freak window that shows off a customizable character on screen, but that was put in to make the game look better in screenshots for magazines, so it really doesn't serve any purpose other than unlockable cosmetics and visual stimuli. In the way of gameplay, it's nearly identical to the last time. Just hit the notes as they pass by the hit window. The controls are the same, which is a nice creature comfort. I said that same thing about guitar games in the last few videos, but it's true. Having a shared control scheme helps to make the game more accessible to people who have already developed that specific skill. It prevents having to learn much beyond 
beyond the new power-ups and how they work and the new charts. Speaking of that, something I didn't mention in both games is that some of the measures have special notes that will give you power-ups when hit. Frequency only has the auto-catcher and multiplier power-ups. Amplitude has a few funny extras, like the freestyle, which clears the screen and lets you rack up points for a few seconds. Or slow motion, which helps you if you struggle with complicated patterns but still want to hit a money segment. Auto-catcher has been renamed to Auto Blaster to fit the new spaceship theme, which is cool and emphasizes that personality they were trying so hard to attain. Beyond the power-ups, this game just feels so much better than the last one. The hitbox to note model ratio is more correct and the hit window feels a lot more forgiving because of that. And the charts also don't feel wrong anymore. This time the notes actually look like they match what I'm hearing. It's worth mentioning that I did try to play this with my guitar controller and it felt okay. The map I used was square, circle, triangle, and cross to green, red, yellow, and blue respectively. Left and right on the D-pad was mapped to the strum bar so that I could use that to change the highways. Personally though, I think it's fine with the gamepad, so the guitar controller idea is more of a novelty than anything, but I at least had to try it. Visually speaking, the game looks way better. The highway improvements go such a long way. I know I already said that, but it's it's just hard to emphasize how important it is. This feeling of moving through a vast space rather than just straight through a tunnel gives the game a more epic atmosphere. Something I don't really care for is the freak. None of the cosmetic options are particularly appealing, and honestly it doesn't even need to be there. But it's just better to assume the role of a ship and forget about that ugly little bugger in the corner anyway, you know? Then again, we're shooting music on rails in space, so I don't think immersion was in the cards. I prefer the note designs here to the previous game. They're smaller, cleaner, and closer to what Guitar Hero would eventually do. I don't really understand the waveform lines underneath them, but they aren't really a distraction, so it doesn't matter. The set list is similar to the last one. 11 of the 26 total tracks were made specifically for this game, which means a lot of new music that I wouldn't have heard anywhere else. That said, the artists that worked on it are a hell of a lot more recognizable this time around. I don't think it hurts the intrigue of the list that much because there's a good balance of stuff that you might know and stuff that you won't know. Right now is a good time to mention the contributions of Cass and Crooker, who created a ton of the original music used in both games. His musical style is extremely interesting and fits really well with the theme. You can find a lot of it on the Symbion Project Bandcamp page. A link to that will be in the description. At the end of every setlist chapter, you'll unlock a boss track to play through. True to their name, these charts are some of the hardest in the game and all of them are long. You can pick whatever difficulty you want, but I picked insane because that's just how we do things around here. I'm not sure how it is on lower difficulties, but on most insane charts you'll get to pick between a few segments to start with. You don't want to just throw yourself at the easiest or the most money segment immediately though. You need to plan your run so that you can keep a chain going. And that means learning how to manage what tracks you're switching between and when. It can be brutal and punishing, but so damn satisfying when you finally reach the end of a really hard chart. This game is so far ahead of its predecessor that it's incomparable. Everything about it is, is just a huge step forward in quality, regardless of how dumb the freaks look. With that in mind, I'll give Amplitude a rating of 8 out of 10. Sure, there are better rhythm games, and this is by no means perfect, but it's so damn good. I would easily recommend this to anybody putting together a PS2 collection. I'll say what I said about Guitar Freaks. I can't guarantee that you'll like it, but I can guarantee that what you see is what you get. If you like rhythm games, if you like Guitar Hero, if you're interested in learning what led to the development of Guitar Hero, then go back and give this game a proper look. You probably won't be disappointed, unless you, like, hate aughts pop music or something. We've taken a lot of time lately to look at rhythm games, so I think these will be the last ones for a little while. I'm now up to 75 games in my quest to play every game ever made, and that kind of steady progress needs to be maintained by preventing any major burnout. It's October now, so I think we'll shift the focus from rhythm to horror in the spirit of the season. I've got plenty to work with, and a few really obscure titles on my mind, so it should be a lot of fun. Until then, thank you, and have a nice day.